Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to introduce Mike Schwartz. He's currently at Yahoo Researcher. And uh, I think he had been to many uh, prestigious institutions also besides Yahoo. He had been a professor at Harvard University. Then he went to Stanford and then Berkeley and then finally to Yahoo. And today he'll present us about uh, something about open source. Thank you. Uh, so let me start uh, with a bunch of disclaimers. Uh, so. Disclaimer number one, the title of this paper is misleading. It probably should have been called Open Source as a Solution to Hold Up Problems, Half a Century of Public Software Institutions. Uh, and not the other way around. Uh, and this is the way I will present this paper. So I'll start with the second line. And then uh, I will continue with the first line and start talking about the history that actually illustrates how open source solves a uh, hold up problem. But First, I'll have to explain about the holdup problem. So rationally, I anticipate that even though uh, sort of the, the second part, the history part, is something like 70% of the paper, and it's a really interesting history. I really recommend reading it uh, because it's something like 15 pages and it's a lot of fun. Nevertheless, I anticipate that I will probably spend 80% of my time on this part, and I will probably uh, end up completely running out of time and spending about three minutes on this part. Uh, but hopefully the, the first part would be sufficiently intriguing that you would actually want to read about the history of open source. Uh, so the other disclaimer uh, is that I am normally not a nervous presenter, but this time I am uh, because I'm uh, talking about something I know virtually nothing about to a group of people who know about this something tremendously more than I do. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I'm an economist, I'm an economic theorist, I prove theorems about auctions, about matching, about market design, and I also design markets where uh, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars actually transact. So that's my uh, day job, studying markets and actually designing them in practice. Uh, my job has nothing to do with software, and I know very uh, little uh, about it, so this paper is very much a kind of a... Uh, a hobby, a kind of uh, uh, exercise out of curiosity, and really here I'm talking about something I don't know much about. So the disclaimer is in order. This paper is a very unusual paper for me. It has no formulas, no theorems, none of that uh, nature. Uh, so I'm just n n not sure. Uh, uh, um, so uh, so uh, finally, um, another important disclaimer. So obviously you probably know that uh, Yahoo uses uh, open source quite heavily and also contributes to open source quite heavily. Uh, and uh, none of the views on the, uh, expressed in this paper have a absolutely anything to do uh, with uh, the views of my employer. Uh, and also, uh, I don't have any inside scoop on, of, on Yahoo strategy vis-a-vis -vis open source. So all the opinions are entirely my own. Uh, and those of my co-author, uh, Yuri uh, Takhtev, who is a, a PhD student uh, in the School of Information at uh, Berkeley. He's primarily a sociologist. He's also an occasional open source programmer. Uh, so with all those disclaimers, well, let me move on to a first slide, completely irrelevant slide for this audience where I'm trying to explain what open source is. I don't have to uh, explain this to this audience, I believe. Uh, I suspect that everybody knows that there are two basic types of open source licenses, permissive and copyleft. Is that, uh, does everybody know the difference? No? Who knows the difference between permissive licenses and copyleft licenses? Ah, I should talk about it. It's because it's fascinating. Uh, so, mm, so generally speaking, open source software is understood as a software uh, where when you get the software, you also get the source code. Uh, together with the source code, you get a license that allows you to modify the source code. That's what open source is. But then there's a second issue, 
Uh, and you're also allowed to share whatever you did. You modified it, you created a new program perhaps, so you take this one, you can share it. That's also part of being open source. You can modify, you can share. But then there's a question when you do share this software. By the way, sharing doesn't mean you share it for free. You are uh, perfectly in your right to take an open source software, maybe modify it a little bit, and then sell it to someone. That's allowed. That's fine. That's allowed by any type of open source license. So uh, the restriction that comes, uh, however, there is a licensing issue. With permissive license, you can do whatever you want. You can take the software product, uh, and then you can modify it, you can sell it to someone else, and you can sell it to someone else with whatever license you please. That's why it's permissive. Do, what, do as you wish, do as you please. The other type of a license is copyleft. Copyleft is quite different and quite brilliant, I have to say. Uh, again, you're allowed to modify and share. And sharing doesn't mean sharing for free. You can sell it to someone. But as you share or sell that software, you have to give it to the new person, to the person to whom you are selling it, with exactly the same license with which you received it. You, couldn't, you are not allowed to change the license. And that means that that person who would get your software, that software from you, that that person uh, would have a legal right to sell that software or to give it away for free to everybody in the world. So as you can see, there is a tremendous difference because basically you can take an open source product with a permissive license, build a commercial product based on that, and profit from that commercial product. If you take software with a copyleft license, you can build a product based on that. But once you start selling that product, you have to allow your users to give away that product for free or to sell that product to everybody in the universe, which basically makes it impossible to, make, to sell it for a high price. right? So, because if your price is at all high, people would start undercutting you or even giving, giving it away for free to everybody in the world. Just a hypothetical question. Selling means selling for money. Let's say somebody takes the open source uh, code and put, um, I mean, the, the techniques hide things in the code which are advertising based, then would it be considered selling? Oh, uh, that, 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 that's an excellent question. Uh, and uh, uh, the answer is, uh, selling is not important here. Share, you, you are still allowed to sell it for money, it's fine. Uh, so it would be considered sharing. And when you share, you have to preserve the license, that's all. So you're more than welcome to take an open source product, to put a bunch of advertisement into it, and to start giving it away to people, or selling it as you please. But you have to preserve the license. So once I got it, you have to give it to me with a code, and I have to have a right to A, modify it, and B, give it away to the whole world for free. But one could, one could put crypto, I mean, mixes up the program so that it's functional to remain the same, but it looks different. You're yeah, welcome. welcome. Yeah, that's, that's always true with copyleft license. You can even sell it on those conditions. Uh, that's fine. But people, you have to allow people uh, to distribute and modify it. But and with huh? Not, with the Not with permissive ones, with copyleft ones. Uh, so, so by the way, as uh, we will see later, assuming we will get to the uh, uh, history part, that copyleft license was a truly brilliant invention that played a very important role in development of uh, open source software. Um, so let me give you a little bit uh, of a uh, summary of how incredibly important open source software is today. Uh, and uh, sort of given uh, this audience, I probably don't have to convince you uh, that open source is very important. On the other hand, given that I'm uh, in uh, the Microsoft right now, maybe I do have to convince you that open source uh, is in fact very commercially important today. So a staggering quantity of open source uh, software. So uh, for example, uh, one can do absolutely fine relying exclusively on open source products. Uh, from operating system to browser to office to statistical software to development tools. And in fact, my co-author happened to be one of those people who over the last three years used only one non-open source program, and that happened to be Adobe Flash that is free. Everything else that he used is open source, and he doesn't seem deprived. So that's kind of interesting because... Or just do fine getting around in a wheelchair. You can do everything. 
That is true, that is true, but there's a difference because uh, he and many other people like him don't feel particularly deprived, right? So for example, if you were to limit yourself to say uh, open source music, well, there's not that much around, uh, not that much of open source music around us, and what is there is very amateurish, right? So all the sort of best stuff is not really open source. Um, so in fact, what's interesting is that free software is high quality. Uh, so oftentimes we think of free stuff as kind of, well, this is stuff for poor people, right? So people who couldn't afford, so people who couldn't afford the real deal, they, they, they go with free alternatives. And that might be the case in many instances. Open source is not it. So in fact, open source software is quite high quality. The competition of open source and proprietary software is largely not on price. This is what's quite interesting. I, when I started writing this paper, I thought that this was about price, about money, but it's not at all the case. So for example, uh, many users of Linux uh, not only made the decision, no, are not only quite affluent and could easily afford Windows, in fact, they paid for Windows and they deleted it uh, and installed uh, a Linux operating system. Um, also, Mozilla, Firefox, and Internet Explorers are competing with each other. Mozilla is open source, Internet Explorer is not, uh, and uh, both of them are free, and yet Mozilla is doing very well. Uh, so again, this is clearly not an instance of price competition. So in fact, uh, also an interesting uh, observation is that the most that use of open source by individuals is in fact the tip of the iceberg compared to use of open source by corporations. As you will see two bullet points later, uh, it is uh, uh, really the corporations, the very wealthy corporations and not the individual users uh, who are relying most heavily on open source. And that again suggests that it is really not about price, it is about something else. So for example, let me give you just a couple of examples uh, that illustrate how incredibly important open source is. The world largest supercomputer, IBM Roadrunner, and the world largest database, our own, uh, are based on open source software. Uh, uh, what do you mean by the, the, so, what software on the IBM Roadrunner is open source? Ah, uh, that is uh, an excellent question. And uh, to that question, I have to confess, I don't know the answer. I, uh, I have a source that we quote in the paper. Uh, and uh, uh, my uh, co author, who is much more a programmer than I am, uh, could um, uh, could give you a much more uh, precise uh, precise an, uh, answer to that. So uh, so if you want to know the precise answer, drop me an email and I will I'll, I'll get you a precise answer. Uh, but but I believe it goes uh, beyond the operating system. I think sort of the whole uh, sort of uh, uh, the so so I, so I presume this uh, so. I, I'm guessing that Roadrunner is probably not a single uh, CPU, but a huge, huge, huge collection of boxes. So, so I would be guessing uh, that uh, basically the program that allows those boxes to work together, that that part must be open source. That, that would be my guess. Uh, but I, I couldn't name the, uh, uh, and, and I presume the operating system would probably also be Linux. Uh, but uh, I, I could, I'm, I'm actually, given that it's IBM, I'm sure the operating system would be Linux. Um, mm. it, 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 uh, code for Yahoo database available? Or, or, huh? I mean, if, if you modify it and, and you don't distribute it, do you still call it open source? Uh, so so th this is a very good question. Uh, no, if you are, so, so there are different types of open source licenses, uh, but generally speaking with, uh, so, sort of internet created a uh, uh, sort of new type of usage of open source software because now a lot of software is used uh, by creating value for the user without actually giving the software to the user, by providing a service. And that's the business that Yahoo is in, that the business is Facebook in MySpace, Google, we are all in that business where uh, we are not software companies in the sense that we are not selling any software to the user. User doesn't see any of our software, uh, but we are providing services. So maybe the great invention is you found a way, or these companies found a way to circumvent the copyright license by kind of not really giving the software, but in a sense 
you know, getting around this restriction? Uh, well, I uh, so I actually I don't think uh, that uh, those companies circumvented uh, copyleft license. Uh, I think that was actually the original intent of copyleft license, uh, because the original intent of open source licenses uh, was that you uh, take open source software and then you use it for your business, for your purposes, for doing whatever you want to accomplish, and in the process you modify it in a way that are useful for you for doing the job that you want to get done. And then you're not required to make it available to others. So this is not a part of open source license to make it available for us. And that was the intent. That was not a, uh, that's a feature, not a bug. However, uh, you may choose to make it available to others. And in fact, if you would look at sort of Yahoo and Google and MySpace strategy in this space, uh, so MySpace is still a baby in this space. Uh, but if you look at Yahoo and Google, uh, Yahoo uh, is a, and Google and many other internet, and IBM for sure, are very heavy users of open source. And a lot of things that are done by those companies with open source stay with those companies. You take open source, you improve it, you don't share it with the public. But a lot of this is shared. So if you look at the list of contributors to open source, you would also see IBM and Google and Yahoo and Red Hat. It doesn't mean that everything is shared, but a lot is, and some isn't. And I don't know the quantities, right? And that's how, the, how it was intended, intended, I believe. This scenario when one could be feature, other could be bug. I took an open source, modified it, and created the binary. One situation is I put binary on, let's say, Yuval's computer for him to use. And another way to use binary is I let Yuval use my own computer remotely to use the same binary. Why one would be a bug and another would be a feature? Why would one be allowed and another not? Uh, so, so, so the point is I. I think we disagree with, I think they did, the inventors of Copilev didn't envision the scenario where people could use the software without, without having it. And so I think it is a bug that they... So, uh, so, so I think... think uh, it is circumventing. They are the same thing. It's not violating the license, but computer it is So, so, so uh, I mean, I think to some extent this is a bit of a philosophical question, but there is there's an answer to this question, and the answer is a new Copilev license. The new license that basically says, well, uh, not only you have to share the source code uh, in case you uh, uh, share the software, but even if you provide a service over the net using that software, you still have to share the code. That license has been developed, I believe, uh, and um, it's very unpopular. Uh, it is not being widely used. And part of the reason is obvious. Uh, um, Google, for example, and Yahoo are very active uh, contributors to open source. Uh, and um, as far as I know, none of the internet companies uh, wish to either use or contribute to software on those terms, and yet they're perfectly willing to see, uh, to, to both use and contribute open source software with a different license. So that seems to suggest that in some very fundamental level, given that we see that sort of open source is really flourishing uh, on those terms, but not with the other license stuff, that, that seems to suggest that, uh, I'm not saying that that, new li that that other license is somehow wrong or evil, I'm just saying that both have room in the universe, uh, and um, at least for now, uh, the, the current one is succeeding quite, quite nicely. It consists of mathematicians, so that's why they're... I mean, we, we, uh, but I don't understand what the meaning of giving binary. If I take a binary and burn it on a hardware, and, and sell that hardware... Would this that is an excellent question, and I have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. The answer is, um, and in fact, I, um, so the, the short answer is, you could not do it. If you take a binary and you burn it on the hardware, together with that piece of hardware, you got to give the source. How do I know that? Well, I know that because uh, one of the most common uh, internet phones uh, called, I think, Linksys, that, that's, I think, one of pretty much dominant one of the dominant players in this space. And of course, those, those phones are the way, the way of the future. I have one of those in my office. And uh, uh, 10 years from now, or even five years from now, probably every corporate office would only have internet phones, right? So this is very kind of 
everyday technology. So that company built that internet phone, and I, I think it's the dominant player in that in this space. Uh, they built that phone using Linux operating system, and that operating system happened to be uh, happened to be uh, copy left. Linux is copy left. Uh, so uh, then they started distributing those phones. Very prosperous company, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, and uh, they were brought to court. They said, look, you are distributing the software, you are distributing the binary, but without the source code. You are in violation of Linux license. And the court said, well, that is correct. And the argument was software is often distributed together with hardware. For example, I. So you see, now you know that I should be right now at the daily marketplace <laughs> sync up, but I'm not. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so, yeah, Outlook respects my privacy. Uh, uh, so, um, so the reasoning of the court was, well, let's say I take a piece of hardware, a floppy drive, and I put a binary in there, I give you that uh, software on a floppy, surely, it's very well established uh, precedent that if I give you a software on a floppy in a binary form, no, you have to also give me a source code upon request. There's a difference. In the so, floppy, you can read the so, binary, but if I burn it on a phone and I don't make it easy to read to binary, then I'm not actually giving you binary. That was the other side was, ar was arguing. They lost. Uh, perfectly good argument, but it's settled. They lost. Uh, so um, learning from this lesson, uh, when Apple decided to develop iPhone, uh, they also didn't go out writing an operating system from scratch, uh, but they went with uh, um, uh, uh, with um, Berkeley standard distribution Unix, which happened to have a permissive license, uh, because I believe it was developed before copyleft was invented, I'm guessing. Uh, no, uh, so. Well, copyleft was also invented a long time ago, but I, I believe that uh, that was the timing. Uh, so, um, so iPhone has a proprietary operating system that is based on uh, open source software with a permissive license. Uh, on the other hand, Android, the Google phone, uh, is actually an open source operating system based on Linux. Uh, so, in fact, that's sort of uh, I think, as far as I can tell, um, uh, received wisdom that Linux is superior uh, to uh, uh, Berkeley standard distribution Unix, which is by now kind of a bit outdated. Uh, and uh, uh, I would be guessing that the only reason why Apple opted for that was that they wanted to keep the operating system proprietary. Uh, but I, I'm not sure. Maybe there were other consider technical considerations. Um, so. Uh, yeah, this slide is taking tremendously longer than I expected, by the way. Uh, so, the time slows down or speeds up, depends how you look at it. Uh, so, mm, a couple of other kind of data points. Most computer languages are open source. And that includes some of the most uh, popular languages, so Java and Python. Java is probably the most popular computer language in the world. The compilers are open source. So interestingly enough, they started very differently. I think uh, uh, Java was originally Sun's proprietary language. It was not open source. And then Sun opened it up, completely opened it up. And uh, they were actually gradually opening it up more and more and more. And then they just gave up and completely opened it up. And they opened it up while they were still the most popular language in the world. And I think they opened it up because they were sort of feeling the pressure. They were afraid uh, that uh, Python or some other language would come from the behind and overtake, the, overtake their standard. And they, want, and they felt that sort of making it open source would make it more appealing. So it was a defensive move, 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 as far as I can tell, I'm guessing, right? God knows. And that's interesting because the story replayed itself, Fortran and COBOL. That's how IBM was opening Fortran uh, back when in the 50s, <laughs> uh, maybe early 60s. Uh, 
mm, so the history has a tendency to repeat itself. Um, so, so it's interesting that if you look at compilers and computer languages, essentially almost all of them are open source. So there are some exceptions, for example, C has a, uh, so actually Microsoft has a, uh, I think a C, uh, is it Microsoft? I'm not sure, but uh, C has some proprietary uh, compilers, but, uh, but, but also plenty of open source alternatives. But essentially, almost everything, like you know, nine out of 10 top languages are probably open source. You look at computer games, nothing is open source. All the popular computer games, are proprietary. So in fact, that's not true. There are thousands of open source computer games. It's just none of them are successful. So this is quite striking. Uh, pretty much all the successful programming languages, with very few exceptions, right, are open source. And uh, none of the games are. So there must be some reason why it is this way. And what this paper is about, what this paper asks is, first of all, why is open source so successful, because sort of as an economist, I could see lots of reasons why it shouldn't be successful. So I wanted to see at least some reasons why it should be. And second, why it is successful in some places but not in others. Uh, so a couple of other sort of observations about open source. Open source completely dominates web serving. And I know Microsoft is a player in web serving. But of course, Microsoft has much smaller market share than Apache servers. So uh, all the big uh, internet companies are using open source solution for web serving. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, Microsoft has a still considerable market share there, but certainly much smaller than open source overall. And also infrastructure of internet companies, like Amazon, Facebook, Google, Yahoo, many, many other smaller ones, is incredibly heavily based on open source, right? So we see that in certain areas, open source completely dominates. And in certain areas, it's almost non-existent. Yes? You say Google is open source, but Google makes you know, 95% of their money from search, right? Right. But their search engine is not open source, right? I mean, I can't get their, I can't get their proprietary code of course the not. way they do page ranking. Of course not. So, I mean, it's nice of them to you know, have all this open source source code, except for what makes them 95% of their money. Oh, so first of all, so first of all I'm not making. Five percent open source and ninety-five percent closed source. So, so for, first of all, I'm not making uh, any value judgments here. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, you know Google and Yahoo are nice and uh, some other companies are. But second, 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 second of all, is, is, is all is, is heavily. No, but 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 second of all, if Netflix runs on Linux, if it doesn't let everyone see what their ranking algorithm right. precisely is, right? Well, wait. So, so, so that's open that's source. Yeah. So you see, you, you are thinking, you are thinking of a competitor. competitor. You are thinking of them as a competitor. No, I'm not thinking of them as a competitor. So, I'm Netflix thinking that, competitor. that that yeah, to claim that Google, the claim that open source is successful because Google uses it, I think is wrong. Because where Google makes their money, which is all in search, that's not open source. So, so let's look at what the company, so, where the company makes its money, and then say so, how much of that code. That, that, that pushes that, the money maker, right? Well, so, so, open source. so, so, um, so not the, the keyword here, the keyword here is infrastructure, right? So I'm not saying that what they create, that, that uh, they're sharing everything with the world. Of course not. Uh, what I'm saying is that sort of the key enabling uh, input for their Technology is open source. I, I'm not saying I'm not saying that it, I, I that, that it does you any good. No, it's not. But that, that, I don't. Yeah. That, you know, I, I think you know the, their key technology is their page ranking algorithm, and that's not open source. So, so I, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of infrastructure level, right? So the operating system that that. No, no. Of course they don't sell it. That's what I'm saying. As users. So you can think of Google in two ways, right? You can think of Google as a company that provides a service, that creates value. Uh, and uh, so, so let's, let's forget Google. Let, let's, let's say we are talking about Chevron Motor Comp, uh, Chevron oil, uh, Shell Oil, right? So Shell is not in the software business, they're in the oil business, right? But they also happen to be a computer user. So if you would find out that sort of most of the software that they use is open source, you'd say, oh, Shell happened to be a heavy user of open source, right? That's not where they make the money. They make the money in oil. 
But you would agree that if they run the operating system on the computers, they run the, op the databases based on operating system solution, you say, oh, well, Shell clearly quite is a heavy user of open source. They're also an oil company. Okay, so, so, so what I'm saying okay. here, all I'm saying here is that all those guys are very heavy users of open source and that open source is critical for their success. I'm not saying that they're sharing any of the, any of the benefits with them. Critical to their success. Yeah, but that's I mean, Google could certainly afford to buy Windows licenses, and it wouldn't even affect their bottom line. Ah, right? that's, that's exactly, exactly the key point. point. Okay. So why don't they? Do, so that's exactly the key point. So none of those companies are poor. In fact, they're rich. And usually, when you are sort of in the business that's winner take all, you take the inputs. You know, the cost kind of. You take the inputs that would make it the best possible product. Right. That's what you want to be. You want to win in the marketplace. And then you just negotiate with the supplier about the right price, right? So if someone has something that works better for you, you will just figure out a deal, hopefully, if possible, uh, and you would use that. So, so what's striking and interesting that those, all those companies are opting not to go with commercial product. They're opting to go with open source. If you look at other things that they buy, you know, they're not that cheap. You know, they buy air on chairs. So, so why is it that they choose to use open source inputs there uh, right, so that is the key point here. Why open? Why do they choose to be consumers of open source? Right. But several of these let's companies let's started out as let's sort let's of let's small open. No, no, but okay, that, that's a legitimate well, point. Though. I mean, why does Google use, you know, Linux that they have to sort of maintain themselves, right, as opposed to buying Windows, yeah. which we would maintain for them? The question is, when did they price. become so successful and rich, and whether at that point did it make sense for them to switch their entire infrastructure? No, so from, uh, Good point, but it's not an issue of size again, yeah. because when you are little, then there's even more reason if, if, if you are little, you're trying to succeed. So, uh, you know, Google doesn't build their own chairs. And when they were little, when they were a poor startup, they just went out and bought a bunch of Aaron chairs for 600 bucks a piece. Why? Well, because when you try to make great software, you need good chairs for the butts of your programmers, and Aaron does the job, and it's fine. So, so you would think that, uh, you know, it's certainly in the interest of Microsoft to get startups hooked on Microsoft technology, uh, so, uh, so surely there ought to be a possible deal between a startup uh, and a proprietary vend vendor where, uh, you know, you would use our software, you know, for the first, until you start making money, you don't have to pay us, or something like that, you know, you, you can figure it out. But that's not the route they went, so why is that? Nobody is going that route in the, in the internet startup field, so why is that? So that's what this paper is about. Um, so, uh, so let me sort of flesh out what are the questions that I'm going to try to address here. Uh, so, economists thought and wrote a lot about open source. Um, so, in fact, including Microsoft chief economist Susan Athey wrote about open source. Um, and um, most of the issues that economists are concerned about, what are the incentives to contribute to open source? And I wouldn't talk much about this. Uh, this is not the question that we are going to uh, address. And in fact, to some extent, so this is definitely not a question why people contribute to open source. There are lots of good reasons, including just for fun. Uh, uh, that's how founder of Linux uh, uh, called his uh, uh, his memoir. Um, and uh, so, by the way, if just for fun were the real answer, then you would expect there would be lots of successful open source of computer games, and there are lots of open source computer games, none of which are successful. Um, so, the real questions we are trying to address is why is open source dominate some important sectors of the software industry and not the others? Um, so, that's what we are about here. And uh, uh, so it's not that surprising that people contribute uh, to open source, right? People do engage in a lot of activities for fun, right? People create music for fun. But how much, uh, you know, you don't see Paramount picture, pictures taking some amateur song that's sort of available copyright free and uh, making it into soundtrack of the movie, right? So all the, uh, but yet you see uh, software uh, companies doing, uh, the internet companies doing exactly that with the software. So why, why is it happening, right? Um, so... So bonus question, so Stallman, uh, who is, uh, I think Richard Stallman is basically the founder of open source movement, uh, uh, he talked to his, so this is a bonus question, why did Stallman, what did Stallman meant when he asked his supporters to think of free as free speech and not free beer when thinking about free software? So 
uh, assuming that I will not run out of time, and I'm sure I will, uh, I will give the answer to this question. Uh, otherwise, you'll have to read the paper. So now let me sort of proceed. So there's no really model in the paper in the sense that we don't have formulas or anything of this kind. Uh, but uh, let me sort of uh, give you the fundamental assumption uh, that kind of drives a lot of things uh, that are uh, happening in this paper. Uh, so one observation, which is kind of obvious, uh, is that uh, one fundamental difference, so one, one obvious difference between open source and buying and uh, proprietary software is the price. But there's one more difference. Uh, open source software is very highly modifiable by definition. You can take it, you can modify it if you know how. Binary software is impossible to modify. So if you take the same program in binary or open source form, in some sense open source without regard to price, is a superior technology. It's superior in the sense that it gives user, certain user, sophisticated user, lots of options that proprietary software doesn't give that user. And that gives us a key why it so happened that it is the most sophisticated and wealthiest users who opt for open source. Those are the guys who really value that flexibility. But that's going to be only the beginning of the story, not the whole story. So, so you can see that sort of this intrinsic superiority of having the source. But it doesn't have to be open if you think about it, right? So uh, there's no reason why sharing the source with the user should mean making that uh, source open in the sense of open source software. I can share my source with you, but give you a license where you're not allowed to share it with other people. You have to pay me additional royalties if you make modifications and blah, blah, blah. Right? So we could imagine those kinds of licensing agreements. They're very rare. It has been tried. There are some precedents of that. There are some companies that do that. But the reason that it is very difficult is contractual costs become extraordinarily high for, for a lot of reasons. It's just too easy to cheat, too hard to monitor, too hard to agree on things. So, so as a first order approximation, we can assume that giving a user a code, that this is, league, this is technological restriction, that once you share the code, you have to make it free. Legally, it's not quite the case. You can write a contract that says it's not. You, you're not allowed to do lots of things with it. But it's so expensive to enforce in court that in most cases, it's just not worth it. Also, it exposes both sides to legal risk. I may be very hesitant to touch your code if I have to sign a paper that I'm not allowed to do lots of things, because later you can bring me to court accusing me of lots of things and charging me for all I, and um, uh, suing me for all I'm worth. And that happened in the past. So, so there are real concerns there. So I will assume, and that's not true, it's first order approximation, that giving user a code is isomorphic to just making it open source product, which is not entirely true in practice. There are counterexamples, but there are few and far between. So that's the key observation that will be driving my story. And I believe, in my heart, that if it were possible to write and enforce contracts along those lines, where I can say, look, I'll give you this code, but we have a complete contract that's totally reasonable that would govern our behavior with regard to this code for all con future contingencies, and uh, you know, it could cheaply and easily be enforced, then there would be, wouldn't be open source software. Because then uh, you know, we will just agree on a reasonable price, and I will get a sort of very nice proprietary product from you and just pay you a reasonable royalty. Uh, and, um, uh, so, so I think fundamentally, this is the technological restriction, the legal uh, sort of lack of legal feasibility of enforcement that created the open source movement. And I think this is a fundamental reason why internet companies do not want to touch proprietary software. So uh, I'll illustrate it. Uh, uh, so, 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 in, uh, so. D due to the fact that users can sort of modify software, it also creates a lot of additional efficiencies, right? User doesn't have to communicate his needs to the, uh, to the vendor, right? So if I'm a sophisticated user, I want to change something. If I couldn't change it, but only a vendor could, then there's this costly process of me communicating those needs to a vendor, hoping the vendor would make a modification. Then presumably vendor wouldn't do it for free for me. I have to negotiate the price with the vendor. And that's the key variable, the vendor uh, may potentially hold me up, right? Even though modification may be very easy since I'm already so invested in this product, and you know, let's say I'm Google, so it's very important for me to modify uh, your product in a certain way, and it's not that hard to modify it, but 
you know, let's say that product happened to uh, 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 come from a vendor who realizes that, hey, this client makes a lot of money, it desperately needs this modification, even though I can make this modification for uh, a million dollars, I would charge a billion because the client is in such bad need of this modification. So that's a classic holdup. A client has this flourishing business that critically depends on this piece and I could exploit this client later on, and there's no way we can sign a contract before that that prevents this kind of exploitation. That's what economists call hold up. So hold up arises from lack of contract, from infeasibility of sort of full contracting for the future contingencies. So let me give you an example that illustrates, and this is basically the key insight of this paper, the way I see it. Um, mm, uh, so let me give you sort of uh, a... Uh, description of what we mean uh, here again. Uh, so, uh, so let's say a buyer of software, product A, makes a complementary specific investment by developing complementary software, which is product B. That investment could be training or could be creating other software, right? So you have an internet startup, they take some software as a base for the infrastructure, but then around it they write lots of other things, they create this whole service. So that investment, that product that they created, could be tremendously more valuable than the software that goes into the foundation of that company. So, however, uh, so, so basically the value of B, the investment complementary to A, could be much, much more valuable than A itself. So, however, uh, if um, it may be necessary to modify product A in order to uh, reap benefit of pro, uh, from product B, from that big investment. So for example, you have an internet startup, they started something out, um, it's going well, now suddenly they're growing, and in order to scale their, uh, their product, they need to change something in product A. But they couldn't because it's proprietary, right? So that would be a big problem for them. They would have to go back to the vendor and so on and so forth. And unless they have ex ante signed a contract with the vendor where vendor said, oh, I'll modify everything at a reasonable price. How do you modi how do you define modify reasonable price? It's impossible, right? Um, uh, the, the, the vendor would say, oh, well, you're such a successful company, just pay us an arm and a leg for those modifications. So that would put uh, that internet company in a position where they would be afraid to invest into other software that's complementary with the software A, with the proprietary software. And that is what driving them to use open source. That's the reason for holdup problem. So in other words, uh, clearly with open source software, there would be underinvestment into developing it. Who wants to create open source, right? I mean, couldn't make money on it. So it is underdeveloped. But this internet company may choose an open source solution, even if inferior, even though there's underinvestment into that, product. Because uh, if they choose proprietary software, they would be afraid to invest into complementary technology. And now they can go all out and invest in complementary technology and in the meantime keep building that, um, that product, uh, that uh, sort of open source foundation of the product. They also may choose to share the modifications they make. And the reason that they would choose to share modifications that they make is that they may hope that other people would yet improve that bottom layer of the infrastructure and they would benefit from other people's modifications. So there may be direct incentive to share at least some of the modifications that you make to open source products that you use. Um, so, um, so in other words, because of hold up buyers of proprietary software underinvest in complementary products. And if you make big investments in the complementary products, it makes a lot of sense to rely on open source solutions. So let me give you my favorite example, and I love that example because it's not software, it's hardware. Uh, so there's a company called, um, um, I think it's called uh, Arduino software, or hardware. Uh, and basically this is an open source hardware product. It's a small company based in Italy. Uh, the startup, I think the sales are about 50,000 chips. They, they, they make uh, chips. Uh, and those chips, uh, all specifications, everything, is open source. You, you can download it, uh, you can buy those chips from anybody else, right? You can just take those specifications, send them to any other vendor and uh, get those chips from someone else without paying a penny to this company. So this company makes money by selling those chips, but they uh, make it possible for anybody else to compete with them. They have essentially no IP. When they develop IP, they immediately make it open source. So why are they doing it? Are they crazy? 
Well, they're clearly not crazy because it's pretty impressive for a startup from Italy to actually sell 50,000 units. What are they doing? So here's my theory of what they're doing. Uh, who buys those chips? Why would you buy a chip? Uh, so they originally developed the chip because uh, it was part of some um, part of some toy or an art. Uh, some uh, I'm, I'm actually not not sure what what uh, what they originally used, but it could be used for toys. It could be used for art projects. It could be used for gadgets. Uh, so it's quite a flexible chip. Uh, so think about it. Let's say you're a designer and you're trying to design something, maybe a toy, maybe something else, and you're hoping you would kind of strike it rich. Right? You're hoping to sell millions of units. You probably wouldn't. You probably make one unit and it would just flop. So you are investing a lot into designing this new thing. So if you are designing something around the proprietary chip, once you become successful and you start, and you start putting orders for like 200,000 chips, the chip vendor, uh, first of all, may not even be able to provide those chips. Right? And say, oh, well, we don't have capacity to build those. Or they can say, oh, we have plenty of capacity, you know, we are Intel, but, uh, you know, we can charge you an arm and a leg. So, and if it's a small company, then you're particularly afraid that, you know, I'm the first big customer. Uh, I'm trying to buy 200,000 chips because I built a blockbuster toy based on that chip. Well, they would immediately just take me for a ride, right? They say, oh, for 200,000 chips, the price would be very high. So, so people would never go with a chip from a small company that is proprietary, because they would be afraid that once they invested everything in product development and design, they actually wouldn't be able to get those chips at a reasonable price. So since those chips are open source, this company pretty much guaranteed that they would never um, take advantage of people who developed technology based on the chips, because the technology is open source. So that, and that's, I think, pretty much the business model. So also there's an incentive to share innovations. Because once I develop something based on this chip, I may want to modify this chip. Uh, I, may choose to share those, uh, I may choose to share those modifications with the public. Why? Well, by, because maybe I'm hoping that the new version of this chip would be better yet, and it would be not just my modifications, but other modifications. And if I'm, say, a toy maker, I'm not very concerned about uh, competition. Talked earlier, I had partially accepted it. But now, when I wear my mathematics hat, it, it looks incomplete in the sense that consider um, the service you are developing. It could be a client side service, it could be some software runs of Windows, it could be server side service, for example, um, <coughs> um, search. And both are, I mean, it's, it's entirely possible, let's say for Google, to use Windows and create its infrastructure. But you will say, okay, what if they had need to make it more efficient? But the same thing ho would hold if you write a client-side software on Windows, which you may want to tweak Windows to become more efficient. So, so the dependency on the underlying layer is, is the same. I mean, Google can pretty much could have run its entire, uh, entire search service on Windows. Uh, so I mean, it would be about the same. That question if Microsoft would give the source. No, no, but why do they need source? Do, do, because do people get source who writes application on Windows? They don't get source. Well, I mean, how big is it and how important is it? I mean, you go to Citibank, right? You know, their clients are very happy with the performance that Windows gives them. And they're interested. And first of all, they don't have lots of, you know, OS and computer scientists in their building, so they would have to create a whole division yeah, but that's to it, modify that's Linux, that's right? A, that's, a, that's a subjective argument, because no. maybe I'm, I'm writing a browser for Windows, and I, I, it might be critical for me to access uh, Well, if it is critical Windows. for you, and you can afford the OS guy, right? Because you need to hire an OS guy. No, no, but I'm, it then might be, would, criti it might be critical for me to modify them. Windows. It might be critical for me to modify Windows to make my browser the best Browser right, and, and his argument is, if it is, if it's that critical for you, then I would like for Linux. Then, then, then you would, then you would cool. hire an OS guy and get Linux. Yeah, then, but people like browser for Windows because the performance isn't that important to them. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Why, in some some cases, uh, performance is more important, and other it's not. I mean, it just. Well, uh, well yeah, I, mean, I think that's exactly. Exact, so I think that's exactly it's the, the nature key. of the P. I mean, it's the nature of the application, right? I mean, yeah. So, so I think that's. Doing that's weather modeling. I need people are writing new browser because they believe performance is important. Yeah, it's so usually for features. Do. It's the features, right? It's the features. It's the interconnectivity. Well, the, 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 the latest browser which was Google Chrome, and one of the things so, they are shouting is we are fast, we are fast, we are fast. 
They're not, they're not saying that they are features. Probably because they modified Linux. <laughs> are, are they going to write the browser for Linux? They're writing for Windows. So it's the same argument. The, the dependency, the mathematical Wait, dependency. Wait, so, so I'm not quite. Like, so, so remember, remember, remember. So, so they did uh, write a brow uh, browser for vi for Windows. But uh, so, so remember, I'm not claiming that the paper that I wrote explained everything under the sun, right? So obviously, there, there are Windows computers, and there are also applications for Windows. Uh, and I'm not saying that it shouldn't exist or doesn't exist. Of course, it does. It's not, when example, when it's, it's not their infrastructure. They said it, I mean, this is like a product. Yeah, yeah but they're not making it. There's no, there's no but you, are, you are making a difference between that infrastructure. Is, I mean, in both cases, it's not infrastructure which is important to Google. It is their ability to serve searches. If they have some magical oracle, they would serve searches. And they could have built infrastructure on Windows. The important thing is to serve searches. Same thing is, is for Adobe. The important thing is to read the uh, PDF file. And so their essential service um, could both potentially so be learned on the there are, some, there are some ISV vendors out there who find the performance of Windows not adequate. Yeah. Okay. And, and then they're they stuck. Linux, so then they're stuck, right? They either put up with the bad, you know, what they consider to be poor performance, or or they go out, they use Linux, and they modify the OS in order to provide them the performance they need. So, so also, I don't think it's, so. So, I think the key key uh, issue here is not that it's just poor performance or good performance. I think part of the issue is that uh, there's some uh, let's say there's some kind of bug. You realize that there's a problem, uh, and you just need to fix something. And if you're a super user and you, know, you have massive scalables, and then say, look, I realize that there's some problem with this operating system. We have to open the hood, fix it up. And the problem would be gone. So if you are using Linux, and, you, and but, well, that's what you see Google doing, right? They they they're massively modifying Linux and contributing uh, to to Linux, by the way. Uh, and I would be guessing that what happens is that they're doing something, and they realize that there's one thing in Linux that doesn't work quite well, uh, and they they fix it. And it's probably a lot of it is just bug fixing. And again, you want to if you're a super user, you want to have that control. If you're a city bank, you don't, right? So I have probably what like two minutes left. Zero minutes left? Well, minus two. But, yeah. Minus two. So give me uh, minus two plus minus two is equal to, let's say, uh, somewhere around the, in the neighborhood of zero. So I'm going to take two more minutes. So let me uh, dwell on history for like exactly two minutes. So, uh, and hopefully it would be intriguing enough that you would actually go out and read the history part of the paper. I promise it's actually the most interesting part of the paper. It really is, and it's short. It's like before going to sleep. Uh, so open source is much older than open source. So in fact, um, the, practice of, of the practice of developing software as public good predates proprietary software by over the decade. Even though the term open source is relatively new, it's like less than 25 years old, in fact, less than 20 years old. The practice of public software, where you get the source and you can do whatever you want with it, so true open source, is actually very, very old and predate proprietary software. In 1952, IBM entered computer market. They were the second mover. Uh, they were within a year of the first entrant, less than a year. So at that time, the word software didn't yet exist. So obviously, the word open soft, uh, software didn't exist either. But software did exist. And um, uh, at that time, the software comes for free with the hardware. And it is open source. You can do whatever you want with it. So interestingly, at that time, um, the amount of money, so there's like this fake belief that expenditures on hardware exploded uh, in recent years. That doesn't seem to be true. So at that time, when first computers were launched in the 50s, the buyers of those computers would spend as much or more on software as they were spending on hardware. And IBM was very aware of it. Except that you wouldn't be buying hard software. You would be having a staff of programmers who were creating this software. But that is an expenditure on software, which was huge. Uh, it was the same order of magnitude as hardware expenditures. So IBM realized it, and they wanted to increase efficiency. They said, we need more software, and it's incredibly expensive to develop. The users at that time were super users. I mean, uh, you know, who should it be to be one of the like, first five people in the five companies in the world to buy a computer, right? So those were really super users. Uh, and, uh, Lowering the cost of programming was, of course, very important for IBM. If there's cheaper software, if there's available software, uh, people would be willing to pay more for hardware. So IBM wanted to encourage sharing of software. So guess what? Within the first year 
of the launch of IBM first computer. They created IBM Share, a community of IBM users. At that time, the number of users you can sort of count on two hands. Uh, for each system, there was a separate, commu a separate share. At that time, there was only one system. So it was within the first year they created this IBM Share. They get together, they share software. Before IBM creates Share, those guys are already sharing, even without IBM facilitation. But IBM institutionalizes it. And uh, here's what's interesting and very insightful, I think. Uh, uh, so, so two dozen organizations who are members of Share for IBM 704. And at that time, those people, they already understand the name of the game. They understand that sharing is its own reward. So you would think, sort of as an economist, I would think, oh, you know, who would want to create software? Who would want to share? You know, I would sit on my hands, I would try to sell it. No, that's not the name of the game. So the contemporaries write that we shared, uh, so uh, next slide. Um, so the eyewitness accounts uh, is that the real problem was not who would want to share. The real problem was everybody was for shoving their software at the throat of the other guy. And the reason is that those guys, even though the word network effect wasn't invented yet in 1955, they already understood it very clearly. They understood that by getting you to use my software, and I already developed a bunch of infra infrastructure complementary to the software, right? I was in this game for six months. Uh, if you would start using my software, you would obviously start improving it for your purposes because you would like, run into lots of problems. And then you would share it with me, of course. So I would directly benefit from you using my software. So they were shoving their software into each other's throats. Uh, and uh, 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 according to Greenwald, United Aircraft browbeat share into accepting the assembly, uh, threatening to leave the group if another proposal is accepted, right? So that was the early days of open source software. So the institutions of soft open source software, completely fascinated, fascinating, predates uh, open source software uh, by, several by uh, several decades, uh, and they evolve in most interesting ways. Uh, thank you. She who you know, was trying to shove his papers down everybody else's throat in the 1700s. <laughs> well, so, so in fact, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I think the analogy is quite uh, quite appropriate. So for, uh, quite appropriate uh, because I think the reason that Stallman felt that sort of free software as in free speech rather than free beer, I think that's exactly what he meant, right? When you write a paper. Your paper is, in some sense, not at all open source, but in some sense it is. So the technology of science is a little different from technology of programming. But I think uh, the way uh, Stallman saw it, he saw a software as kind of in expression of uh, human intellectual activity, an output of that, and he wanted other people to be able to build on that, to be able to create new stuff from that, and the price wasn't that worried him. He would have been probably fine if you know, there is a reasonable system of payments there, uh, but he didn't see how it would be possible to have a reasonable system of payments. But that's exactly what worried he, him. It was like proprietary science versus open science, the science based on which other people could build. And he felt that it's imperative for the human endeavor for people to be able to build based on the software that came before them. Um, and that's why computer programmers feel very strongly and emotionally about open source, even though, hey, they're not the ones who, who are paying the price of software. They're happy when software is expensive. And the users like, like me don't feel passionate about open source at all. Uh, they, they don't see a moral issue there, even though the users should be very happy about open source. Hey, isn't it free? But it's the users who don't care and programmers do. And that's why it's free speech, because for programmers it's free speech, but for, for users it's free beer. Thank you.